Good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Ulrich, director of NYU Washington, D.C., and I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's event co-sponsored with NYU's Bradamus Center. Tonight's dialogue will be with Mayor Majita Melendez as she offers a perspective from Puerto Rico about local governance during natural disasters with a focus on crisis management. She will discuss how the island is progressing in its reconstruction from the devastating 2017 hurricanes and debt crisis. Gregorio Igartua will join the conversations, which will be moderated by Giovanni Romero. I had Spanish in college, so I'm doing my best here. Um, Giovanni Romero is a columnist for CNN based in Washington, DC. He is a political analyst, international consultant, and lecturer. He's written many articles on the eradication of poverty, human rights, governance, democracy, and elections, as well as the role of women in society. He is the founder of the Dominican Republic Center of Public Policy, Leadership, and Development. Gregorio Igartua is an attorney and certified public accountant. He holds a master's degree in international and comparative law from George Washington University Law School and has served as a consultant and advisor to the Senate of Puerto Rico, the Puerto Rico House of Representatives, and the municipality of Ponce on various financial, tax, economic, development, and other policy issues. He has contributed to the multiple judicial processes claiming the democratic rights of the American citizens of Puerto Rico and recently appeared before the Human Rights Commission of the Organization of American States demanding recognition of these fundamental rights. Dr. Majita Melendez was sworn in as mayor of Ponce, Puerto Rico on January 12, 2009. She wrote a new page in the history of Puerto Rico when she became the first mayor elected by the people. During her first term as mayor, she became the first woman to preside over the Organization for the Integral Development of the South. Both in 2012 and in 2016, she was re-elected as mayor in both her second and third terms. Before becoming mayor, she began her professional career as a dental surgeon for 31 years, standing out both for her clinical area and in education. Her commitment to public service and especially to the city of Ponce impelled her to get involved in various boards and committees in which, on a voluntary basis, she offered her advice, practice, and knowledge. During her administration as mayor, she has overseen five, overseen five signature infrastructure projects worth $177 million. She graduated from the University of Puerto Rico with a Bachelor of Science degree and a Doctor of Dental Medicine. Please join me in welcoming our guests for tonight's dialogue. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. How are you tonight? Good. Yeah. Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, <laughs> don't be cruel. <laughs> yeah, I know. We really appreciate you guys being here, especially on this occasion, since most of the people now are just you know, celebrating this wonderful day. And I'm really glad to be here. It's just a great pleasure and honor. And I just want to say thank you to all of you for joining us tonight um, for this event where we, we are pretty sure that this very interesting and dynamic conversation will answer many questions tonight. So the thing is we are, we have, you know, we hope that this discussion, this conversation will, will be very dynamic and as I just said and here I'm joining a very distinguished panel with the Mayor of Ponce, Mayita Melendez, and Mr. Gregory Gartua. So we are getting insights on the situation in Puerto Rico, and we are getting also uh, a, a perspective from one of the island's leading mayors and, and public affairs expert. So first of all, I want to thank the New York University for all their support for this evening's event. And we are really proud. We are really glad to be here. So thank you very much. And I think that this panel will discuss current uh, political and economic and social issues in Puerto Rico right now. And we are featuring Mayor Melendez and Mr. Igartua. So, but I think that First of all, we need to maybe ask for a quick show of hands. So how many of you have been to Puerto Rico? Quite a few. And how many of you have been to Ponce? Can ah, you, that's good. Can any one of you share some impressions you might have on, 
on your experience during these visits to Puerto Rico so we can have like a frame, a frame of reference before we get started? Before Maria or after Maria? Yeah, that would be great, that would be great. So I think that we can, we can have a wonderful discussion here. So I just want to start by saying that that Mayor Valendez uh, is a tremendous leader. She's been the mayor of Ponce, which is the second largest city of Puerto Rico for almost 10 years now. 10 years. Yeah, 10 years. Okay. And as, as um, was said before, you've been working for, you've been working for, for your people pretty much your entire life and prior to. My passion is to serve the people. Yeah. I, I, I did it as a dentist. In, in, the, in the health campus. Now I am doing it in another way, but not only it has to be with health, but administering the, the city, and at the same time, talking with the people, expecting what uh, the need is of the people, what are the needs of the real people of all the communities. And I was explaining, uh, Giovanni, to the class of, of the professor uh, from the media, I was telling them that I know that you have visited Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico has 78 cities. Before Mamma Maria, we have a recession, an economical recession since 2006. But even though we have a recession and an oversight fiscal board that Congress uh, and the President, uh, President Obama imposed to Puerto Rico by, by the Congress mandate, uh, even though we were skip working, we were doing things, but we live in an area that we have a hurricane season from June the 1st through December the 1st. That's a hurricane season, six months of the year. So we are accustomed to have hurricane, but not the kind of hurricane that Irma and Maria hit Puerto Rico. It was a complete devastation of the island. In the, in the areas of uh, Ponce is in the south, as you, some of you have visited, in the south, we have the Caribbean Sea. In the north of, of Puerto Rico, we have the Atlantic Ocean. So our, our climate is different from the, the people in San Juan, and it's too much sun in, in Ponce. Too much sun in Ponce, and it doesn't rain too much. It doesn't rain too much. Now, we are uh, just uh, seeing the news that uh, 24 cities are, are going to be rationing the water. They are going to ration the water. So we have to, uh, my team, I call my team and I say, you already have to make the plans. We have the plans, we have uh, to make prevention and before uh, this, uh, the, the company that manage and administer the water system could stop the water to different uh, areas in the south and in the, in the east of Puerto Rico. So uh, after Maria, after Maria, 16 months after Maria, we still need to reconstruct the island. We are a territory, but we have been always citizens of the United States. We are citizens of the United States. We are American citizens too. So. Before Maria, maybe 15% of the people from here, from mainland, knew that uh, Puerto Rico, the, the, the citizens of Puerto Rico are American citizens. After Maria, uh, Elizabeth Warren told me about seven or eight months ago, now 95% of the people on mainland, they know that you are American citizens. You can imagine, you cannot understand, maybe, or people don't understand the history of Puerto Rico. They say, I am, the, uh, I am in my third term as a mayor, as a mayor third term, and I was the first elected woman, woman as a mayor in Ponce. All the mayors in Ponce uh, has been always men. Ponce is a machista city. So you can imagine how it had been the, those, those 10 years for me. 
It has been hard. I've been crying sometimes. I have to talk with my two daughters. I have two daughters. They are two lawyers. They live in San Juan. One work for the House of Representatives uh, president as a consultant, and the other work in the Senate uh, as a consultant at the same time. So uh, they, the one is already married, so they are out of my house already. So I spend my days, 24 hours, seven days a week, uh, working for my people, serving the people. So we also are very privileged to have Mr. Gregorio Aldua here, who is a lawyer, Puerto Rican lawyer, and CPA is- Puerto Rican. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta go, because they, they were saying Puerto Rico. I say, hey, you talk Spanish. Puerto Ricanos. Puerto Rico, entonces, Puerto Rico. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And um, he's specialized in international affairs from the University of George Washington University. So, but before getting further, I like I like to take this opportunity to congratulate Mayor Melendez on getting a very important award, uh, the Lula Award Gala last night, where she received a cultural cultural Please. tribute to on behalf of the American citizens of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico and. We want to congratulate her for the amazing job she's been doing since she first uh, took office and before that because she was working for her community as a dentist for more than 31 years and that's a very important uh, fact because she is very devoted to, to serving the people, to, passion. she's passionate about public servants and public service and that's very important. So to begin this conversation, um, I'd like to ask you to tell us about your trip, your agenda in Washington, D.C. this week, and what are those main agenda topics for Congress uh, that Puerto Rico is advocating for? First of all, uh, I have been since Maria. I have been mostly every month here in Washington, visiting Washington, visited the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I have been visiting the congresswomen and congressmen from Republican and Democratic Party at the same time. I have uh, been in the universities, and uh, for example, uh, George Washington uh, University, uh, Georgetown Catholic University, Howard University, to tell the people, to tell the students and the people that, that are in those universities what happened before and after Maria. Uh, so uh, I came uh, this week, uh, uh, first of all, because uh, LULAC, who is an, uh, is an organization that works uh, for the civil rights of the Latinos member uh, communities. And, and they, they, I, I was supposed to be the last speaker uh, last night, and I was the last speaker. And uh, they gave uh, an award to uh, mayors from, some mayors from the states, uh, from here from mainland, and some congressmen and congresswomen also at the same time. And uh, I have to, uh, to receive the award, and then also uh, at the same time in the hotel, in the same hotel that we're staying, uh, in Mario St. Marcus, at the same time, uh, we have every six uh, month meetings of the DNC, Democratic Party, and uh, I am the National Committee Woman of the Democratic Party in Puerto Rico. So those, uh, those uh, uh, trips that I come here uh, to, to DC are paid by my proper uh, uh, salary. I don't charge it to the, to the municipality because first of all, it's a, it's a political party, and the second of all, uh, I, w we were in a recession, economical recession, and I took measures, economical measures in my city so we can, I don't have to suspend any employees uh, to maintain the employees over there and to maintain uh, my act, my budget in a right way, so I I resign uh, to uh, diets. I resign because uh, to the mayors and to elected uh, government official, you receive money in your trips, so you can charge it to the municipality if you have a trip of 
that have to uh, don't uh, have to be in any exercise or anything you have to do with the, with the, with the city or the government. I resigned. It. I resigned as, uh, at the same time every time and, and, uh, the trips everything. I resigned. I lowered my uh, my salary three times. I got lowered. It. For example, as a dentist, uh, I have a salary of twenty. Uh, Twenty thousand dollars a month. Now I receive four thousand three hundred dollars. But my my daughters are uh, her, her her careers. Uh, they have their houses. So I love to serve. So uh, I take my measures. So uh, I came for the awards. I came at the same time for the DNC. And I came to see some congresswomen and congressmen here at the same time to talk about the disbursement of the money that we need uh, for the reconstruction of the island. Even though they have, uh, the, the Congress have approved some supplemental aid to Puerto Rico, the money, they have a sign, but the money haven't been dis uh, disbursed to the people of Puerto Rico. So the mayors are, uh, working with their own proper budget that we receive from uh, uh, taxes, property taxes, uh, uh, from, the go from, uh, from the people that live in our city. So the income tax. So uh, at the same time, I, I, I was going to talk here. I, going, I, I went uh, this morning to John Hopkins. I was in a meeting the rest of the day uh, in the in the DNC uh, meetings, and uh, at the same time, I am in some interviews in, in TV and Re and Univision, CNN, to talk about how is uh, the reconstruction of Puerto Rico? How, is, how are we going to be resilient if every six months we are expecting that some disaster will come as a hurricane or, or, or something that attack uh, Puerto Rico or hit Puerto Rico? So I came, that's the reason I came. But every month I am coming to talk to everyone. Because the, that money has to come to all the mayors and the central government, or the state government of Puerto Rico, to begin the reconstruction. It has been 16 months. When uh, after Maria, a year after Maria, there were people without power in Puerto Rico. The first 50 days after Maria, I didn't have power in my, in my, in my house, in my home. So I have a generator, and I give it to my daughter because she has a, I, I have a granddaughter. So she was seven years old. So I, I said, no, take, take the generator. I have another generator, so I give it to a place where the, uh, there were uh, People, we call a place La Guancha. La Guancha is a place near the beach where there is a boardwalk, and at the same time, there are kiosks that sell uh, foods, uh, drinks, and people during the Thursday to Sunday go to have music, uh, uh, feel the, the fresh of the, of the sea, and it was completely destroyed, the boardwalk. But the people in the kiosk, we gave the generator so they can start their business. Now, 16 months after, we are doing business. We just received today our six cruise line ship. And we take, and they were sending me all the pictures and they say, we get down, as you recommend, the 3,000 tourism that were in that ship. And we receive in a different way than in San Juan. We, uh, uh, make it the area with artisans. We made music. We gave them piña colada. We give coffee. Uh, we gave uh, paella. Paella, you know, that's Spanish rice. At the same time, free, free. And there are packages to see in different places in Ponce. We have in Ponce the best, the best museum in all Latin America, Museum of Art. Even though we have 11 museums, they are open. The municipality has, the municipality have uh, 410 buildings. And about a uh, hundred of them uh, were hit by Maria. So we need to reconstruct 
and we are reconstructing with the advance money that the insurance company gave us. I, I, uh, we pay, we pay, uh, the municipality pays uh, $4 million for all the properties of the municipality as an insurance. Uh, and we insured the, the, whole, the whole buildings uh, for $500 million. But uh, we are going to be negotiating with the insurance company this week. I just signed uh, for $21 million. So with those $21 million, I am going to begin the reconstruction. This week, the governor just announced that the first supplemental aid of $1,500 million sent to Puerto Rico, they just assigned three cities to have an advance of, uh, of money assigned. Assigned not the same time as you get the money. It will take about three more months to get the money. But Ponce was one of the city because we did the right thing in doing the federal documents. We write the inspection, the dimension, the description, uh, the scope of work, uh, all the all the uh, cost estimate we did we did it in a right way. I am an apty corrupted uh, person. I don't believe in corruption. I'm sorry. That's my what my moral values are. I'm a Catholic woman, and my father and my mother told what it, what is not your part. It is not for you. You have to take care of that. And I take care of all the things of my city and worry about my city. So that's why I come, I, I came uh, this week uh, until Sunday. I'm going to be here. Then on Sunday, about eight mayors of, of Puerto Rico, we are going to be in a bid for uh, buying uh, in an area of 134 uh, uh, square miles of equipment for the municipalities. The, the prices are lower. And I will be about three or three days over there in Florida to buy some uh, machinery that we need to reconstruct the island. Thank you very much for your comments and for sharing with us about what you are doing to help your city, rebuild your city, and to get Puerto Rico back in, on its feet. So we really appreciate that. Now let's talk a little bit with Gregorio. Gregorio, can you share with us um, your perspective about um, the unique status of Puerto Rico and your work in the legal field uh, to ensure the full voting rights for all citizens back there. That would be great. Well, thank you, Giovanni, and thank you for uh, to NYU for having me. Uh, the status issue uh, makes uh, people a bit uncomfortable, you know. Uh, but we cannot ignore the core of all the problems in Puerto Rico. I'm not saying that you know uh, every little thing. I said Puerto Rico again. Puerto Rico. Sorry. Uh, she always do, does that to me. Uh, the the issue. The, the issue regarding the status, as I said, was uncomfortable. But at the end, it's the root cause of most problems. Because if you believe in governance, if you believe in democracy, and in, you believe in, in full uh, citizen participation in the decisions that affects them, then by virtue of us not having all of those at the federal level, uh, we are not enjoying full collective and individual rights. Um, the issue, obviously, I cannot, uh, in five minutes, I cannot tell the, the 120 years of, of our history. But it's important to know a few facts regarding Puerto Rico. First of all, we are American citizens. We are fifth and sixth generation American citizens. That's important. We have been American citizens for 102 years now. So it's not like we gained citizenship two or three years ago. Uh, my, my parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents have, have been citizens. Uh, that's number one. So there's the, the, the individual uh, relationship to the nation as citizens. Uh, as you know, Puerto Rico is a territory of the United States. Uh, that definition is constantly, you know, people assume that territorial status is very firmly, uh, 
is set on stone, you know, the definition and what it entails is set on stone, but it, the uh, a very big problem that we have is that the courts are very inconsistent in their interpretation of what that means and what that entails. And it has changed not only due to economic and uh, uh, geopolitical uh, considerations, but it also has changed in the way that the law has developed. For example, uh, I always say that you cannot uh, try to, to understand Puerto Rico by going, to, trying to think like, as if you were in 1898 or as if you were in 1950. Things have changed. Uh, human rights developed a lot during the, the, the past uh, 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 100 years. Uh, the concepts of sovereignty that were uh, you know, paramount to, to, to any other values, uh, they are still important, but they 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 are a, a bit curtailed by 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 human rights, so so they have changed. Uh, today, the reality is that I don't like uh, Puerto Rico. You use a lot the, the term colony. Uh, um, I know in international law that that term's not used that much anymore. But in international terms, we are not, we're not non self governing. We truly aren't. Uh, federal laws and regulations apply to us as the same as any state, but we lack participation in Congress and Senate. We only have one resident commissioner who does a great job. She's really, really good, but uh, she doesn't have a voting power. We have no representation in Senate. And as I was telling to the students this morning, you know, the geographical, the, the, the geogra this geographical fact affects us polit politically. We, I cannot take a 200,000 people from Puerto Rico and bring them uh, to Washington to express their views, as maybe people from around the country, it's easier for them to do so. So it's very expensive to do that. And if you don't have a voice in Congress, in the Senate, and you cannot vote for the president, and you are removed from the mainland, it's pretty difficult to present and, 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 to, to, and, and to fight for, for what you believe and, and, and to... <sighs> To live in, in, in a place where democracy is not a mirage, where, where we are truly uh, uh, involved in the decisions that affect us. In that sense, and, and to conclude, uh, Giovanni, as, as I said earlier, my father, uh, I'm going to, a little backstory. He's uh, a lawyer. Yeah, my father's a lawyer. He used to study here in Georgetown, and I was born in, actually in Alexandria. and. Uh, when he moved to Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, uh, he used to vote here, and then he, when he got to Puerto Rico, he lost his right to vote for the president in Congress. And that always stuck to him. So since we were little, uh, my father has uh, been very acting in pursuing the recognition of full democratic rights for the people of Puerto Rico. And he has filed numerous cases. And uh, I was born into that. That's part of my DNA. I think every every Puerto Rican DNA has, you know, the status issue is clearly very important to us. But in my household, that was, you know, a very important topic. And I, uh, I've been very involved for the last 20 years with that as a lawyer, helping him. And recently, uh, we went to the Organization of American States to present our issue, the same as DC did once. Uh, you know, it's, you gotta take this into consideration. It's, you know, it's, I'm not going there pre presenting a complaint uh, or, or filing a complaint or stating a complaint against a foreign country. It's against my own country. You know, and it's difficult there. Sometimes you forget that we limit it to, to citizenship, but you know, we are part of the US. Uh, that, that's part of, my, of who I am. And you know, it's uncomfortable for us to have to come here and, and, and express and explain that all the time. And to go to the Organization of American States to do that, it, it's, it's a bit embarrassing for us. I would rather do it here in Congress or do it here and then express all, all our positions here, but we lack that representation for 120 years and time is of the essence now. So we, we have to go to all forums. And, and lastly, I would say that I, I, I truly appreciate the opportunity given to me in that sense by the mayor, who is obviously a great advocate for statehood everywhere, uh, and for the more than statehood, the, 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 our basic 
uh, and most fundamental democratic rights. So you're going to have to vote on primaries, but not elections. Ah, I'm going to get, tell you. I, I think this is uh, very interesting and may, m might show you our, our, our position. Okay. So first of all, we can vote and participate fully in the, in presidential primaries. Here. So we have, and, and, and they go to the conventions and everything, and they vote, both Democratic and, uh, and well, Republican. So let's say my case. I come back to live in D.C. where I used to live 17 years ago. And no, not in D.C., maybe. Well, in D.C., I can vote for the president. No, not, not a good example, but let's say I voted for the president, right? or in Virginia, and I voted for the president and elected and voted for senators and congressmen. And I decide to move anywhere in the world without, without thinking about coming back, permanently, permanently move my resident to everywhere in the world, Cuba, Venezuela, North Korea, anywhere. I can still vote. I can still vote as an absent, uh, uh, as an absentee voter, but if I move to Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, we lose the right to vote. So any of you that have been voting all your lives, you can move anywhere. But if you move to Puerto Rico, which is an American, a US territory, and all of us are citizens, is the only place where you lose your right to vote. As Congress, you know, that we've been dealing with that. And, and it's interesting because, listen, people think that the legal process it's very, and I am a lawyer, I'm, I'm supposed to think in a way like that, but that it's very, uh, that it's always based on precedent and it's, uh, and, and, and you know, there, there are very logical and clear um, 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 steps uh, taken, uh, philosophical considerations taken before these decisions. But truly, if you analyze the decisions, it's amazing. You get one decision today from the Supreme Court or the first uh, circuit, Court of Appeals, which Puerto Rico is part of, uh, and they say they treat Puerto Rico a certain way. And they say, well, Puerto Rico is almost like a state. It's like a state. They use that a lot, and we are. Uh, it's like a state, so these federal laws apply the same as anywhere else in the nation. Then two weeks later, uh, you get a decision that says, well, Puerto Rico has a very particular status, so these rights, uh, these uh, basic rights do not apply to Puerto Rico. We are sorry, we, em we empathize with you, but they do not apply. And that's the wording. It's, I, I'm not making this up. Uh, I, I, we would give you the right to do this and that, but uh, the Constitution does not provide that for us. So most constitutional clauses which use the word state are applied to Puerto Rico. They don't say state or territory. They are applied to Puerto Rico. The, uh, let's say the Commerce Clause applied to Puerto Rico. But when it comes to voting rights and other fundamental rights, well, they are limited to states. The Constitution expressly states states. So you are not a state, you cannot do so. So it's like that. I'm not making it up. I wish I was, but I, not so. That's part of what, that, that issue is not a political issue. You know, imagine dealing with the, with, uh, with this disaster and this situation and having that uncertainty and having that backdrop, it's very difficult. And to, co to have to come to explain to congressmen, as the mayor said, thankfully, more people are aware now, but to have to come to Congress and explain people who represent the congressmen and congresswomen, hey, listen, we are American citizens, and they don't know it. They didn't know really. They thought we were a foreign country. And they decide things that apply to us every day. At 18, I received the same letter as any males here receive uh, for the selective service. We have gone to all the wars. Uh, we have done everything, not, not just the recent wars. As, you know, for 120 years, Puerto Rico has participated actively in all wars. But when it comes time to the recognition of rights, Political and other considerations take precedent, and it's time to move on from that. So, and you, all of you, uh, have a part in that too. You know, uh, obviously, we need your voices uh, because, as the mayor always says, we are Americans too. Thank you very much for your for sharing your over, overview on this very critical issue.
given the fact that Puerto Rico is the only place of the United States that you lose your voting rights because of your zip code. I mean, it's really, it's really interesting what's going on down there. And now I'll li I like to turn over to Mayor Melendez and what are the principal opportunities ahead of Ponce and what keeps, pe what keeps you up at night? People laugh sometimes because they think that uh, we the mayors uh, have uh, a car that uh, someone drive, uh, you have a special office. We are workers. We are workers. We work for the people. We work to serve the people. And I work 24 hours, seven days. I work on Saturday and Sunday. I only ask to let me on Sundays go to mass for one hour. And then after that, I have many activities because everyone in the, in the city wants us to be with them. Because the, 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 the government that is near the people is the local government. I go through the La Plaza where in front of the municipality, there are the two powers, the political party, the municipality, city hall, and in front is the church. In every city of Puerto Rico, you will see that. The center of the area is a plaza, it's an area. You have one side, the church, and the other side, the city hall. That's, that's common in the 78 city. That is the cops in front of Spain at the same time. And I go every place and people talk, Majita, come over here. I would like to talk to you. They don't see the governor every time. For example, the governor of Puerto Rico uh, in, two, in two years has been 20 times in Ponce. But they don't see everybody. They go to a special, he goes to a special event. He stay there for one hour and he, he, he go away, uh, he go again to, to San Juan. He lives in San Juan, in Fortaleza. So I, I work really for the people. If there is a fire, I have to be there. They said, for well, you are a fireman, no. Firewoman, no. But they want to see the mayor there. You have to solve every. This is a joke, but this is not a joke. It was true. I received public the people of the citizens in Ponce on Wednesday, from 8 o'clock in the morning to 1 o'clock. Then come this, uh, this guy, and he was 90, 93 years old, and he said to me, Mayor, I want to see you. And I said, what's your problem? And he said to me, I am a, wi a widow. And I said, yes. Can you get me a, 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 new, a new wife? And I said, oh my god, what are you going to do? Are you asking me to get married to you? And he said, no, I want a wife. I don't want to live alone. So we have to solve every issue, every issue over there, every issue. Even though there are issues from the state government, people think, citizens think that it's my issue also, so I have to solve it. For example, after almost a year, there were communities in Ponce that didn't have power, didn't have power. They didn't have the power. So no electricity for one year. They say that, uh, the, uh, the analysis that uh, George uh, Washington University made, they said that in Puerto Rico after Maria died about 3,000 people. They didn't die because of the hurricane. It was the effects after the hurricane because there were chronic diseases, but the hospital didn't have enough fuel, so we the mayor have to solve the problem. At the same time, for more than a year, there was no power, for, uh, no power. there were no water at the same time. For the first 100 days, first six months, we were giving to all the persons uh, uh, with FEMA uh, water, food, every time, every time. I have to go to the rural area, and the, I have communities from the city hall to that community. It takes me about an hour in a car. So I have to visit all my communities, my 300 communities, because people want to see the mayor. And the mayor is the person who solved all the problem. I have 2,000 workers in my city hall that have different agencies. And we work uh, not only uh, in health department. When I came as a mayor, there were no health department in the local municipality. And I, as a dentist, I said, no, I am going to make uh, a health department. So I have two bosses, medical. I, I, I came here to Mayland and I construct and design 
a bus for, for uh, medical services that can go in, in the bus and service all the people in the communities and a gentle uh, bus at the same time, and we go through every community. And at the same time, I, we, uh, the dentist that is working in the, in the bus do certain jobs. Not all the exercise of the dentist that, that, a, that a dentist had to do. But we refer to dentists in Ponce or to any place, specialists. For example, one of the things is that here you go to a dentist, maybe to an extraction, for example, maybe it will cost you 150 in Puerto Rico, the insurance company pay $20, $20 on extraction. I have, a, we were two dentists in my office before I was a mayor, and, and she said to me, you know, I'm going to live in Texas. They offered me a job in Texas. And she left me the office. So I buy the office. And three days after she came here, she said to me, what are you doing? And I said, I am doing an instruction in number 23. We, uh, th there are uh, uh, 32 teeth in, in, in an adult uh, mouth. And we, know, we named them by, uh, by numbers. Uh, and I said to her, I, I'm doing an instruction on 23. How long will it take you? Maybe three minutes. And she said to me, how much uh, will it cost you the, uh, to pay the, the insurance? And I said to her, uh, 90 days, they will pay me $20. And she said to me, yesterday I made an instruction in the same tooth, and I already have to check. The insurance paid me 24 hours later. It's different. Puerto Rico is different. Is there any particular story that you witnessed during the day that Hurricane Maria hit the island? And maybe you want to share this yes, story with us? Let me tell you this. We have a problem in Puerto Rico. People, by years of years, by, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's research costume in many places that live in the rural area. They receive their, their home or the house from his grandfather, they lived for 20, 30, 40 years, but they didn't have the documentation that they owned that land and that house. And when FEMA came, they said, give me the papers that you own, and the documentation that you own the, the place. They cannot show it, so they cannot give the money. This is federal money. This guy is about uh, 75 years old, and he make a loan, private loan, to repair his house before Maria, before Maria. He took a loan about for uh, uh, $45,000. He reconstructed his house in wood. We have to be resilient, right? I don't, I don't believe in fossils. I believe in renewable energy, solar energy. And we have to be, by that time, we have to be uh, resilient in that. And he took the loan, $45,000, he made a new house. He crossed the street, and in front of him, his son lived over there. But his house is made in cement, okay? In cement. So, uh, the day of, of, uh, of the, that was hit by the hurricane, his son called him and said, Dad, come over here. Come over here, please. And he said, well, we, we will be standing here, uh, we will be here, we are okay. No, cross the street and come over here. He crossed the street with, uh, with his wife, and five minutes later, the hurricane destroyed his whole house. Then he went to FEMA with all the documents that proved he owned the, the house. FEMA didn't give the exact money and said to him, you have to take a loan as as uh, small uh, SMB, SMB, Small Business Administration gave the money. I, and FEMA gave them uh, $30,000. $30,000 to reconstruct his house. He has been three times at the hospital. And he has lost more than 25 uh, pounds. And he received, and he's still living in, his, in, his, in the rural area with a generator. They don't have power already by generator. And they have water because 
we brought a generator for the whole community. And the generator moved the water so they can go in those houses in those areas. So you will see how people were suffering. Now we're doing business, everything is raising up. Uh, nature is beautiful. We are receiving cruise ship, but we need to reconstruct all the supplemental aid that Congress has approved. Hopefully things will get better for him. And I have a last question for Mr. Igarpua before hearing some questions from the audience. And what, what is the economic situation, the economic activity, activity in Puerto Rico? Is Puerto Rico still um, a banking hub or a pharmaceuticals manufacturing center? Yes. Um, yes, Puerto Rico continues to be a, a banking hub, and, and, and uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, pharmaceutical um, companies in Puerto Rico. As you know, during the hurricane, that was one of the issues that a lot of products who are very important for some surgeries are mostly made in Puerto Rico. So there was a logistics problem that would have had a, 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 an effect on the mainland. Um, in general, Puerto Rico, I, I don't like to say uh, Puerto Rico has uh, a lot of potential. There are a lot of opportunities, and as the mayor said, we are back in business. I would, you know, obviously, Maria has been the, uh, from, a, from, a, from a human side, uh, uh, it has been awful, you know, an awful situation. But uh, you have to be positive in life, and, and, and Maria has... Uh, had its benefits, uh, two particular things. Number one, we, you know, there have been a lot of, of, uh, of practices that are part of our, our idiosyncrasies, and we have long held practices that maybe were not, you know, best practices for, and, and, and were not, uh, they didn't adjust to the modern uh, economic eco ecosystem. And number two, there are a lot of areas that uh, the reconstruction process will deal with that will greatly benefit uh, our future economic development. A lot of basic infrastructure, uh, if the money, obviously, is in finally disimbursed, but obviously there's also uh, private, private investment. And um, if uh, investment in basic infrastructure is uh, done as it has been planned at the very least, uh, it will be great for Puerto Rico. For example, uh, Maria, took down most, uh, bless you, uh, took down most of the uh, telecommunications uh, systems in Puerto Rico. So they are reconstructing them and using, uh, I think it's 5G now, so, so they are using the latest technology. Uh, so hopefully that will happen with, with other important areas. Puerto Rico has a lot of potential. There are a lot of opportunities, a lot of untapped opportunities, uh, good properties at, at reasonable prices and uh, a very skilled workforce and uh, strategic uh, location for, for commerce in Latin America and other places. So definitely, uh, we're not only open for business, but I think there are a lot of opportunities for economic development. Part of it requires us to do some adjustments, and we are cognizant of that. But also, some of them uh, will come from private enterprise, and obviously, the federal government hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do right for us and, and, and assign the necessary funds uh, for Puerto Rico's reconstruction in a resilient uh, manner. Let me tell you this. Yeah. One of the, 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 the best things that happened after Maria is that uh, the people of the community began to work with us. We heard them and we worked for them. And they can express in a way in a democracy what can be done in their community. My budget is a participated budget that I give participation in the community. They decide what they want to repair or do in their, in their community. They choose. And they said to me, no, don't make a, uh, an art center. No, I don't, we don't need an art center. We need uh, to reconstruct the roof. OK. Uh, a sport arena. What? We make the sport arena for that. But one of the things is that the best sport in, sport, sport in Puerto Rico is politics. <laughs> it's politics. I believe in statehood. Ponce is now, we have a mayor who believes in statehood. So the new progressive party won over there. It's the same party of the governor. Then the two cities that are close to me, they are from the Commonwealth. 
the mayors are from the other political party. Uh, we talk, but we are like this. Oh, hello, how are you? All fine. Now we are united. We are united. They need my help, I will be there. I need their help, they will be there. So we are creating not only an association or federation, federation is the one who believe in statehood of mayors, association of mayors is the one who believe in commonwealth. Now, we are doing a league of city. Wow. Ones who believe in commonwealth and the others one that, that believe in uh, statehood, we are working together. We are working together for the benefit of the well-being of the people. And that was the best example. I have been uh, uh, treating about 3,057 3, 3, people in the communities. They are leaders. And they are well trained in health, in how to cook, in communications. So if another hurricane hits Puerto Rico, they are the first responder in that community when I get there. And they are well prepared. And we are teaching people from every community. And I told my, all my, my colleagues as mayors, the one from, from who believe in statehood and the other who doesn't believe in statehood, I said, hey, do it in your, in the, so the, the best thing that I use uh, as, a, uh, as a system in my community, in my city, they're using it. And we share, we share every, any, anything that they need, we share it. If they are in a duty, we help them. So it's the best thing that happened after Maria. Politics is now, it is not now the best sport in Puerto Rico. Thank you very much for sharing that. It's very inspiring that politicians in Puerto Rico are finding common ground for the well-being of the people. So now we like to turn the floor to our amazing audience. We really, we really look forward to your questions Please feel free to raise your hand and ask questions, please. I think we have a microphone over there, another one on the right side. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm not really sure how it works with Puerto Rico being that um, it is a, a, a part of the United States, like you guys were saying, um, with foreign direct investment. So I know that you guys are saying a, a lot about like private investment and getting money from the federal government here in the United States, but where does Puerto Rico stand in, um, in trying to get foreign direct, foreign direct investment from other countries to? Uh, I can say, I mean, That's a great question. Uh, the, the governor just and, and the Cong uh, uh, Puerto Rican Congress, uh, Senate and House of Representatives have made laws Law 20 and 22 for incentive, so uh, pe people from other uh, places can go and invest in Puerto Rico, in rent, in buying build, in buying buildings, uh, and they make in and give them incentive, mm. economic incentive. So to to make uh, the investment there in Puerto Rico, the one of the things. The other thing is that there are, are many organizations from mainland, for example, Clinton Foundation. Foundation of Puerto Rico, organizations that are by person who take uh, a half a business, a, a wealthy business, and they give help to different areas in Puerto Rico. So for example, Chef Jose Andres, who has, he was here. Jose, Chef Jose Andres is a friend of mine. And Jose Andres create a, a funding to help uh, little farmers uh, to invest in, in, the, in, the, in the farm, and he's helping them. So people can invest in those farms to grow uh, foods and many other things in farm. And he gave food, to, uh, he made food with World Kitchen uh, Aids. Uh, in Ponce, for example, for almost one, uh, one to, th to three months, wow. he, he, in Ponce, in San Juan, in many other places, 78 cities. So we're making reforms. We make an educational reform. We make economic reforms, uh, by budget reforms. We are making reforms, and we are open doing business at the same time. Okay. I just wasn't sure if, like, if Puerto Rico was allowed or if it was illegal no, no. for foreign direct investment. Okay, for foreign direct investment in Puerto Rico, you have to consider, you have to see that the same as 
any other part of the uh, of the nation. So we have, uh, of course, we're open to foreign direct investment, private investment. Okay, so the same as any state or territory of the U.S., the same treaties, uh, international treaties, apply to us. So, so for example, uh, uh, what used to be NAFTA applied in Puerto Rico, the same as as, as the states and everything. Uh, so, for, we're open to foreign direct investment. However, the same as is, as in the states and territories, if you're talking about uh, uh, governmental investment in Puerto Rico. It can be do, uh, It has to be limited to what is allowed here in the states. You know, a uh, place like China, uh, a country like China, who has direct has uh, uh, governmental enterprises who who invest in, in in the United States in certain areas. Uh, if they they are allowed to do the same in Puerto Rico, but but we don't have any. Um, th that's what that's what when. When you visualize Puerto Rico from a legal standpoint, you, you, you have to start, the starting point is, imagine you're in a state, everything applies, not everything, but almost everything is exactly the same. Federal, same federal agencies, uh, they say, and, and I wanna clarify this, they, they say, well, you don't pay uh, federal taxes. Well, uh, I would. First of all, it, it is not that we don't pay federal taxes. It's that certain um, income from Puerto Rico is exempted from federal tax. Number two, the IRS, for example, published a, a, a table about uh, what they receive from every state in the nation. And sometimes they include Puerto Rico, sometimes they don't. But we actually uh, pay more federal taxes than three or four states. Small states obviously do. So, so you have to start there. There are exceptions, mm -hmm. exceptions, but, but you have to imagine it's easier if you start. We are like a state with a few exceptions, including not having uh, the full democratic rights, but it's almost the same. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Do we have another, any other questions? Please, go ahead. I'm guessing they need to record the uh, audio. Uh, my name is Duke. I'm from uh, Hawaii, <laughs> which is interesting to the extent that uh, we grapple with the same things our island brothers and sisters grapple with. And my question is under the topic of income disparity. So, you know, right now in Hawaii, obviously anyone can come and, you know, rent property. But the problem we perpetually have is um, you have obviously people from other countries that can come and, you know, drop $200,000 in a house. And obviously this creates... Um, uh, I don't know how to, how to describe it, but it creates problems for native islanders who don't have that kind of money. Uh, definitely want to live in their homeland, um, but we struggle with this sort of back and forth, and obviously because um, you know, many people don't think we're um, a part of the United States too. We're definitely Americans, um, but I think because we're an actual state, it's a little bit more difficult for us, and I wanted to see if you can uh, talk about this, uh, this notion of income disparity. Well, first of all, you gotta you gotta understand that uh, Puerto Rico is Puerto Rico is. I think it's uh, the the average the mean income is uh, like forty percent less than the than the than Mississippi, which is the poorest uh, U.S. state. So, uh, in that sense, you imagine that situation in Puerto Rico is much more difficult. As the mayor explained, uh, there's a, a disparity in what you can earn uh, here and, and, and in Puerto Rico. And pri prices used to be really high for property. I think you're, you're trying to get somewhere that it's uh, uh, something like gentrification, uh, I think, is, is what you mean. Uh, well, it happens in Puerto Rico. There's a lot of investment, but actually, uh, I think the biggest problem in Puerto Rico is not the price of the of the of the properties per se. Is the issue that most people, their income is really really limited. There are people who are not that limited, but it's really sixty limited. percent. They explain. I, I was reading an analysis. I'm sorry. No, no. I was no. reading uh, an economic analysis that made this uh, this lady from Puerto Rico. She's a lawyer. She's a CPA, and at the same time, she's an, an economic study, and she made an economic uh, book about After Maria. 
And she was explaining to us that uh, Puerto Rico has a big debt just right now. 70,000 uh, millions, millions, 70,000 millions. And from that, uh, uh, she said that uh, the, the debt of the municipalities are only 6.1% of that debt. So we no, are, are not causing the debt. It's a state government. The second thing is that 60% of the population of Puerto Rico live under poverty. 60% after Maria. So there's an issue that the, the issue in Puerto Rico more, more than cost is this. So if you're, and this is one of the problems we've, we've had, you're a doctor, right? And you have a license that you took the same exams as everybody else took in the nation. We take the boards. Yeah. Oh, for example, I, the C, my CP, the CPA exam I took, it's the same as is given in, in the whole nation. So let's say I'm a, I'm a doctor in Puerto Rico, or I'm a teacher. Teachers in Puerto Rico, for example, earn about an average of $18,000 a year. So they go to, and you know, I don't know the, the number exactly, but it, it's in that area. So let's say Texas uh, needs uh, bilingual teachers. They go to Puerto Rico and offer them $50,000, $60,000 a year. So for, for that person, more than the cost of, of, of living in Puerto Rico, the issue is an income issue. So for, for a lot of that people, just moving to the US, to the main, to mainland, to the continental US, which we can do so any day. I can move tomorrow and work anywhere I want. Um, uh, that's rather more than an option, and it has created a lot of problems regarding property in Puerto Rico because the demand for property, for private property, has gone down uh, uh, freely, really, really badly. You know, it, it has gone downward really badly. Uh, uh, and there are a lot of properties that are available. So it's, it's different. It's an income and population issue. If I may just, for a second, I, I, I always say this story because it's the same. You know, Puerto Rico, when I was, I was about to buy a house for my family uh, because I have two little kids and they, uh, I needed, uh, I was in an apartment, I needed to buy a house. And one of the issues that, that was uh, really unsettling for me was, well, I'm, I'm making an investment right now uh, for X amount of money and, and, and you know, Maybe I feel I'm going to pay this house for 20 years, and in 10, 20 years, the house is going to be worth the same or less. That has happened in Puerto Rico a lot. So people, I, I was talking to somebody the other day that they, they bought a property in 1998 for X amount of money, thinking that it was still going to go, um, you know, appreciate in value. And 20 years later, the, the house is worth exactly the same. So that's... The issue in Puerto Rico is rather one of demographics and income. If, 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 I, if Puerto Rico was a uh, state, how many members of the House of Representatives we will have, and how many members in the Senate? Well, in the Senate, we'll, we'll have two as any, uh, any other uh, state. But that's clearly one of the uh, political, logistical issues of, of Puerto Rico's status. Uh, if Puerto Rico were to become a state now, we would have uh, five, I think, last time, according to the 2010 census, would be like four or five congressmen. Five, five congressmen. So, so imagine, that's one of the issues. So if, you're, if you've been in a state that has been a state for 200 years, and then comes little Puerto Rico, and we'll have more political power in a sense that you, uh, well, I understand that part of it. It's a logistical, political issue. But at the same time, uh, someday, the, uh, you know, we, we'll have to deal with this. You know, we cannot prolong it for, for, forever. And it's an issue that's not going to change. Maybe it changes if everybody leaves the island at the rate they were leaving the island. But, but you know, that's one of the logistical issues of, 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 of the status uh, problem, as they like to say, or the status issue. I think we have another question over there. And how are we on time? Uh, probably one or two more questions. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks it's kind of a question, kind of a statement. 
Uh, I have the Emerald Planet TV and part of uh, Emerald Planet International Foundation. We started uh, 45 years ago, but we were the intersect between the environment and economy. And of course, Puerto Rico fits nicely into all of that. Uh, but after the hurricane, we've done 12 TV shows about, about what's going on there and the devastation that you faced and the need for actually not redevelopment. We said it's not redevelopment for development and transition into that. So uh, my question is, and again, more of a statement, is what kind of best practices have you seen? You talked about the nice things that's happened in Ponce. We've actually covered your, your city in our television program, actually quite a bit. And um, so what's some of the things that are going on, maybe in agriculture and uh, renewable energy, uh, you know, other aspects of the environment that's improving things. Energy and is necessary, and just the governor just right now make reform uh, to change the system, uh, the old system of energy. So, for example, there are three cities in the center of the island that these three cities uh, have a, an energy plan, and they are and, and they are reconstructed that come that that area to give the energy to these three cities, and they want to separate from the system of the of the state government the electricity or the power so is going owned off by grid. the government they're going is off owned grid. by the government mm -hmm. the governor i know there is an idea to sell the company well i don't know if selling the company will be the best uh, thing uh, selling the the system of is owned by the governor by the government because if someone from canada buys the system they will not care about if we paid uh 40 cents uh, a kilowatts, they will, not, they will not care. No, they have, he have to take the money that he's going to pay uh, back again. So uh, I say, uh, and in Ponce, for example, I believe in solar energy. Mm -hmm. And for example, one of the foundations here, Health Foundation from, from Mayland, gave my, my vaccination center, I have a center, uh, to, with vaccines for, for, for the kids and the, and, and the people. And the doctor get a proposal from this foundation to get in the roof all solar panels. So we will be at, at the same time earning uh, the, 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 what we pay just right now as an energy is too much, it's 20, 21 cents or 23 cents a kilowatts. So we have to lower it because it's impossible. Yeah, so I think company Hawaii. can go over there and invest if they has, yeah. uh, if, you, if we can lower the the power down. Well, the interest we have is anything is in the, it's in anything in the green space. It's not just energy, but it's water, it's waste, uh, waste uh, treatment, uh, recycling, recycling. Uh, agriculture, and recycling. all that. So my question to you, the real question to you, is there enough of these? Uh, you know, best practices that now have evolved since the hurricane, that we can actually do a series of television programs about this that we can bring across the United States, because we go to all 214 countries and territories. From the area of Guayama, is in the south, the city in the south, and when you cross Calle, which is in the mountains, and you go to all the straightways uh, down to San to Ponce, you cross about five cities, mm -hmm. and, and you see all those land they are the best land to make agricultural uh, cultivars. It's the best land. It's the best land. And they are developing them. They are developing them. Tourism is the other way. Mm -hmm. The third thing is recycling companies, the waste companies. And uh, 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 all have to be with energy and power. Every company, we are, we are asking for proposals. People are uh, asking for proposals. I came here with you to see about five or six company, energy company, energy company, that they went to Puerto Rico and they asked the governor to, and, and they gave proposals to the governor. So there are many opportunities just right now to invest in Puerto Rico, in tourism, in making, for example, Ponce, we have the best uh, gastronomy in, 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 in restaurants. They are developing many restaurants in Ponce, restaurants, mm -hmm. uh, pharmaceuticals. We have uh, uh, about five or six. We, I have five industrial areas. Panel, uh, um, 
There is a, uh, just right now, there is a, a, a company who makes the panel over there. We have a port and an airport at the same time. Yeah. Well, we're not looking at it from the standpoint of bringing investment. We want to know what the best practices that are actually happening and occurring that can be replicated okay. and okay, shown so around, the, around, the, uh, around the United States, as this is an example of what Puerto Rico is doing on its own, and then also around the world about this beautiful place called Puerto Rico and what the positive things are happening. So that's what we're all about. Yeah. But we can speak after this. But I just wanted yes. to raise this issue. I, I just wanted to briefly uh, to, uh, say this. Um, there are, you know, the construction or reconstruction or, or the development, uh, the redevelopment or development, as you stated, uh, Puerto Rico takes time. Obviously, uh, uh, there, are, there are a few different stages. As, uh, as we are open for business, we are operating, but at the same time still, uh, there are a lot of things that we have, we are, we are working on still trying to get them back to the way they were before, not because we want to, but we have to for practical reasons. For example, we didn't want to reconstruct uh, the grid as it was, obviously, there, the, but we had to do it because first thing, we had to take power back to everybody and we didn't have enough time to change the whole system at once. So regarding best practices, and, and this is what I was going to, uh, uh, to uh, we are now passing to that second stage where hopefully the disimbursement of money will come. And we are, um, we are making a, 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 a true analysis of all our practices in every area, particularly in infrastructure and trying to reconstruct and, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a manner which is consistent with uh, green sustainable values. Uh, we are actually in the development of, we are in that process right now uh, of developing and, and, and analyzing best practices. And, yeah, oh, but as I told you, the same thing that happened for two telecommunications that the, the, you know, the new system is a very modern system. Hopefully we can do that uh, regarding um, water, uh, regarding agriculture, uh, power, and using our natural resources in a more efficient way. Something that, the, for example, Puerto Rico there used to be, and she's uh, working with that uh, a lot now, um, we are being very, very strict with, uh, with uh, people dumping their, their uh, the trash uh, anywhere, because during the hurricane, that was one of the issues. You know, it affects. Uh, you don't maybe if you don't see it, you don't mind. And obviously, there are uh, uh, other environmental factors at work. But during an emergency, if you have a, 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 an old freezer left in in the woods, it it, it it turns into a projectile. So so all of that that you know, it's not that it was tolerated because it, it's not, you know, we have strict laws against that. But we are, are, uh, 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 we are analy analyzing ourselves first. And we know that many of our practices we, we have to revise and we have to be more strict because, you know, they are essential uh, to, move, to moving forward. We're not just calling and asking for money and telling, hey, everybody, uh, uh, solve our problems. We are working hard on solving our, our own problems and are only claiming what is just and, 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 and uh, appropriate for the circumstances. But, but we are, uh, we, those who, who are left in Puerto Rico, we are, we are working for the island and hopefully all those practices will be implemented and, and we'll have a more resilient uh, and sustainable island. Hopefully, when that money starts getting into Puerto Rico, will be used in, for developing sustainable projects and initiatives and small businesses. So that's that's a great idea. And I think we have time just for one last question. And yeah, please. We are recording, so I guess. Sorry about that. I'm a special ed teacher, you know, been for many years. And um, I just was wondering what the education was like down there now, when the elementary schools, the structures, 
you know, and, and what that's like for the kids because you have kids in the rural areas and all over the place, you know, and they have to have to go to school. So I didn't know how that was now. For example. Yeah. I have a program uh, for kids uh, two years to, uh, from two years to five years, Head Start program. For me, I have the best star program in Puerto Rico. I have a gym for my 1,600 kids. I, I treat uh, people who uh, uh, are pregnant, and before uh, the, the kids are born, we're teaching them how to manage his kid and how well educated, and after he's born, he, she can bring uh, the, uh, the kids, uh, because we have early Head Start and Head Start. Uh, at the same time, we are using technological, uh, every uh, smart boards, smart tables. We are using robots with the teachers and uh, helper teachers also at the same time. And it is not a nursery. It's a, a well done education system. And for example, I have a granddaughter. She's in a private school. He's an, an American in English private school. She talks in English like you talk in English. Beautiful English. She played in English. She played in English. She talked all the time in English. And I said, can you, can you talk in Spanish? And he said, why? I, 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 I took all my classes in English. So the, I will say there is a new educational reform in the public school. Private, school, uh, private schools and Catholic schools are excellent. I, I grew up in, in a Catholic and private school. He did the same way. So my daughters were in a private school. So they can talk in English, they, can, uh, they are well-trained, they are well-educated, they are lawyers. So many people are well-trained. The best handcraft in all the Caribbean, uh, 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 Iceland or in Puerto Rico, in, in, in the Caribbean uh, area, is Puerto Rico. Because we are well done, study, we are well educated, and a university system function, private universities and the same, the public university. But the university, I study in the University State from Puerto Rico. I am a graduate from the medical school of Puerto Rico. But the private system is excellent. But there are new reforms that is managed by a secretary that she comes from here, from Washington, Julia Kerlinger. She's from here. And she has been changing. Buildings of school, public school, are all building, all building. So if there are people moving to the, to here to mainland, those school, she's checking by, by computer how many students there are in a school. She, saw that she consolidates schools in different area, and the governor is selling those schools for private investors. Or give it to, uh, for example, I am asking, uh, one school that is close uh, to make uh, the area for my city police. We have municipal city police. I have 300 city police that uh, uh, 20 years ago, the, the, their office, the commander officer, is in a third place where sport arena is there. So I, I, I am going to reconstruct that school to make the station for them the commanding station there. So uh, uh, the, the governor is going to uh, se uh, give me the school from one year. After one year, he's going to sell me the school. So school system, Head Start is the best. Head Start is the best program just right now. I have, in technique, uh, the, the kids know how to manage uh, uh, the tablet. They know how to manage the tablet. They know how to manage the smart board, the smart board, the, the, the table are smart at the same time, the robots at the same time. They are excellent in doing and I'm well educated. The only thing that I'm worried about when they change from that's a Head Start to a public school, because the Head Start is for people who cannot pay a nursery. So it's, it's a certain salary. Uh, for the communities. I, I wanted to add something. Um, the, uh, I'm no educational expert by any means, but 
I do have kids, and I obviously lived in Puerto Rico for all my life. In private um, school? You have your kids in private school? Oh, of course, uh, uh, that's another issue in Puerto Rico that we can discuss later. But I, I would say that the hurricane definitely had a, an emotional effect on kids. That's, you know, to all kids. And obviously, uh, I don't want to understate that uh, the effect on education. But I would say that the issue in Puerto Rico regarding education, more than the hurricane, I would think uh, the stress uh, caused by the fiscal crisis which limits uh, resources greatly. And number two, the demographic issue, as the mayor stated. Uh, a lot of peop kids are moving uh, halfway through the semester, and a lot of schools uh, that used to have a certain amount of students, and they are designed to operate that way, well, they don't have the students anymore. So we are also in that process of reanalyzing and reevaluating everything, hopefully, uh, uh, things will work out great, and but the main issues regarding education in Puerto Rico, I think, are the fiscal issue, which uh, uh, it causes a, a very uh, uh, so it causes stress to to the to the budget. It stresses the budget, and uh, demographic issue also. Obviously, that the economic situation in Puerto Rico causes a lot of social issues that have an effect on education. But from the governmental standpoint, I would think demographics and the fiscal issue are the, the, the two main areas that, are, that are, have an effect on, on education. That's, that's Thank right. you. And I'll say one, one sentence. You know, in the United States, which is your part of, you know, when you have a kid who has special needs, they're entitled to getting special help, you know, to the age of like 21 or 23 or whatever, you know? So I was wondering, in Puerto, in Puerto Rico, do you have programs for those children who have special needs, whether physically handicapped, autistic, learning disabled, because they're entitled to get that kind of help. And that's just something I was going to mention. I don't know how that well, is. Or uh, the Secretary of Education, Julia Kerler, is working. We have a problem with that, disabled kids. And, uh, and the governor is conscious about that. He's conscious about that. And uh, she's taking care, because there are parents do demand the Department of Education if, if, if they, in public school, don't took the kids. In private school, the, gover the, the government sent a special person in a private school to take care of the kids. And that person is paid by the government, and he stayed all day with the, with the kid in the private school. But in public school, it's different. Yes, it's different. And she's trying. To, to change that and taking care of the disabled kids just right now. So I think we need to wrap up now because we are short on time. So thank you very much for, for hosting us. Thank you, NYU, for everything and for all your support. And I really enjoy this conversation, this very interesting discussion. And of course, the amazing questions from the audience. And thank you for everything. Please have a good night. and. Hope, hope to see you soon. On behalf of the people of Ponce, I would like to thank all the people from Megan, all the organizations, all the people who helped Puerto Rico uh, when we needed after the, uh, Maria uh, hit Puerto Rico. Really, it, we see that, that the people, many, 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 many media came from, from, from here, from the nation, from mainland. Many people, groups of doctors, educators, organizations from here to help Puerto Rico. So we have to be very grateful for that. I am grateful for the Congress because even though uh, they have approved certain things for us, FEMA, at the same time, I, I uh, you know, uh, I have to, th I have to be thankful too to Trump because he, he has approved certain things, but in other way, he, he's going to make that wall uh, with the money of Puerto Rico, I won't worry about, <laughs> and the, of the money of California. Yeah, it's, it's awful for that, but thank you. For thank you.